Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is John Hamry. Uh, welcome. Glad to have all of you here. We're very fortunate that uh, Prime Minister Dombrovskis is here with us today. He was delayed up on Capitol Hill, and uh, I don't know why that would ever happen. You know, I'm, and uh, but I'm delighted that he could join us uh, for this event, and it's uh, we're looking very much forward to having him speak with us. Uh, our, the, the Latvian delegation. Uh, we have say, seats reserved up here for you, so please join us up in front. Um, <laughs> I've always marveled at when a country gets in trouble, it somehow manages to bring forth its very best sons to help through the problem. And of course, that's the case here. This is an unusually talented man who had a sparkling and bright career in the technical sciences, in physics, and then PhD from, from Maryland here in town in engineering, but at the same time uh, had was able to get a master's degree in uh, customs policy and, and tax policy, and all of a sudden coming forth at a time, founded a political party, and uh, coming forth at a time now when Latvia needs almost precisely this combination of skill and talent, because this is a challenging day. But we have an unusually gifted man who's in charge, and so we're looking forward to his presentation. Our time is a little bit compressed. We're first going to to uh, hear the Prime Minister, and then Heather is going to help field questions. Uh, Heather, do you want to make any further introductory remarks? And let me, let me turn it to you, and thank you, Prime Minister, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamry. Uh, knowing how honored we are that the Prime Minister is with us, and this is an important moment uh, as Europe tackles a daunting crisis, and, and Latvia is certainly at the uh, forefront of, of meeting that challenge. And Mr. Prime Minister, we're just grateful that you could be with us uh, and our, our partner and ally in so many of the great endeavors of the day. And so with that, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you can either choose to remain seated or you may use the podium. We'll welcome your remarks and then we in, will invite you all to join the conversation. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a, a great honor for me to uh, have the opportunity to address you here at CSIS. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for the president and organizers of this event. So uh, in today's uh, presentation, I would uh, briefly go uh, through the uh, situation as it has developed in uh, Latvia as regarding uh, economic and financial crisis, and also uh, uh, some uh, thoughts of how, how the development should uh, uh, or could continue in uh, Eurozone and uh, also in uh, uh, Latvia. So uh, to put uh, <coughs> Latvian crisis in the global uh, economic uh, crisis uh, context, I'll also try to uh, uh, make some uh, parallels. Uh, so in any case, uh, we had uh, similar developments as uh, many other uh, countries uh, had, including U.S., just pushed to the much more uh, extreme side. So uh, after joining the EU in 2004, we uh, experienced a per period of strong growth. Uh, at some occasions, our growth rates even exceeded, uh, 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 increased to double-digit growth rates. And there was probably too much optimism about the uh, economy, to about too much optimism about uh, are behind us, and there is going to be eternal growth. And uh, unfortunately, it uh, turned out in global financial markets. It was a time when the uh, uh, world was booming, and Latvia was booming probably twice as much as the uh, world. But uh, also, uh, while uh, this economic development, there were also signs of trouble, which at that time apparently went unnoticed. Uh, uh, while having a double-digit economic growth, we still had a uh, budget deficit, and the uh, government was interpreting uh, a Maastricht criteria, which sets limits to budget deficit, way, way too uh, simplified, basically saying as long as budget deficit is below 3%, which is Maastricht criteria <laughs> limit, everything is just fine. Of course, uh, that's not true. What master criteria really says is that uh, uh, budget should be balanced during the economic cycle, and then in a times of uh, stagnation or recession, it should not exceed 3% uh, of GDP. 
Whereas our approach at that time was like, okay, we have 10% growth and our budget deficit is still below 3% of GDP, what do you want? Uh, uh, also, uh, having this uh, problem, we had uh, inflation and also inflation. Before joining the EU, for five years, we had inflation between 1.9% and 2.9%. And then, after joining the EU, inflation at certain stage reached, uh, again, a double-digit figure. So it was some 10, 11, 12% uh, inflation. And uh, part of this was uh, uh, fueled by, or most of it was fueled by domestic uh, consumption, which in turn was uh, fueled by the easy accessibility of bank uh, credits. So what we had during the years 2005, 2006, amount of credit in our economy doubled. So those were huge, uh, uh, huge uh, credit increase, and that's where we were part of the booming global financial markets. There was easy credit, our currency was pegged to euro, and uh, we were basically importing EU monetary policy, meaning low interest rates. 85% of our, our loans were in euros, which people then could exchange to lots at the fixed exchange rate, and uh, uh, enjoy this uh, uh, cheap uh, credits. So this uh, was uh, really uh, how our imbalances uh, build up and uh, also it meant while having an economy which is running on, uh, on credit, so to say, we also created a large current account deficit and if uh, a decade ago or so, uh, people uh, were saying, economists were saying that the current account deficit of more than 5% uh, of GDP already spells some trouble. Then in 2007, we had a current account deficit of 22.5% of GDP. So uh, uh, another issue was real estate bubble, which uh, then a uh, couple of months after the US real estate bubble bursted, our real estate bubble bursted, but uh, with a, a difference that in US uh, prices were going down uh, from the peak values maybe by some one third. In Latvia, in some segments, the prices were going down by two thirds of the peak value. Uh, so really we were uh, the real uh, uh, showcase for uh, economic uh, disbalance and the last uh, drop uh, was uh, once uh, uh, financial crisis started and uh, uh, many financial institutions started to have problem. Also, we had to nationalize our largest independent commercial bank. Uh, altogether, we put directly in some 4.9% of our GDP in cash, another 2.6% of GDP in guarantees, and that was exactly the point when we had to turn to IMF and European Commission for uh, the international loan uh, package. So the international loan package was created of seven and a half billion euros uh, to, uh, uh, to finance our uh, economy, finance the budget deficit, stabilized financial sector. And uh, of course it came with a conditionality of uh, rapidly reducing uh, budget deficit. And then the debate uh, started of whether we should uh, devaluate our uh, currency to address part of the imbalances and in this way to uh, get down the real income and values uh, and uh, of savings. Or uh, we should stick with our exchange rate, which is effectively pegged to euro and go through the internal devaluation and uh, fiscal adjustment. So we chose the second pass, which uh, at that time uh, created lots of questions and doubts about among economists, is it reasonable, uh, uh, why, and is it possible? Uh, also, there were speculative attacks on LATS, like in June uh, 2009, we had a speculative attack on our currency well, which was successfully uh, fought. Uh, but in any case, so what we choose, we choose to have a, a fixed exchange rate and go through the 
uh, fiscal adjustment. So all in all, uh, in 2009 amendments, in 2010 budget, we went through a fiscal adjustment of well uh, over 10% uh, of uh, GDP, which uh, uh, in such, such a short period of time is well almost unprecedented, at least we have not come uh, up any uh, examples where uh, this uh, could uh, had been done. <laughs> As regards the uh, uh, general economic and social policy, uh, basically our work was divided in three main directions. First was fiscal adjustment, uh, fiscal consolidation. Second was economic stimulus, of, of which we could afford given the fiscal consolidation. And third was uh, social safety net to ensure uh, social uh, stability. I will briefly go through the three main uh, those directions and then uh, separately, of course, there was agenda of uh, structural reforms which were partly linked to the fiscal adjustment, uh, partly run by the fiscal adjustment, but also uh, many of them were long overdue uh, before that. So on fiscal adjustment uh, measures we took, uh, not, not very surprising ones, uh, tax raises, uh, including raise of uh, VAT rate, value added tax, uh, uh, including uh, raise of excises, uh, some uh, income taxes, uh, wage cuts, uh, reduction of uh, social benefits, uh, reduction of uh, public sector uh, uh, jobs, uh, so all in all some uh, more than 14,000 uh, public sector places were downsized, which may not sound uh, huge here, but we are a country of only 2.3 million uh, people, and on that scale, it, uh, of course, uh, feels uh, quite uh, substantially. To give some examples, like central apparatus of our ministries were reduced on average by 30%, 30 zero. Uh, number of different kind of agencies was halved. So really, we, uh, and if we look at the budget, uh, uh, state budget financed institutions, uh, average salaries in first quarter of this year are some 25% below average uh, salaries in 2008 uh, uh, of 2008. So uh, really, it's a very substantial adjustment we had been uh, taking. Uh, second, given this uh, adjustment, we couldn't really rely on domestic consumption as a driver of a, our economy. So we had to uh, do something else, and not very originally, because many countries are talking about this. So we also decided to be like export-oriented uh, economy and the fiscal stimulus which we had, which mainly was coming from European uh, EU funds, being a member of European Union, we can receive certain structural and cohesion funds which uh, for support of uh, uh, economic development, for support of infrastructure, for some social programs. We reallocated those resources quite substantially towards uh, uh, support of entrepreneurship and especially export-oriented industries. Uh, we created the uh, export credit guarantee scheme as of June last year, and uh, it seems to have been uh, paying off because the uh, first quarter of this year was the first uh, quarter after eight, month, uh, after eight quarters uh, when we had a recession. In the first quarter of this year, we had 0.3% uh, growth quarter and quarter. Whereas if we look at the... Uh, figures of industrial production and uh, exports. So uh, first quarter this year to first quarter last year, industrial production was up 7.4%, exports were up 10%. So really we see that not only we are coming back to economic growth, but also our uh, structure of our economy is uh, changing and uh, regaining competitiveness certainly was one of the uh, key uh, priorities uh, for this uh, fiscal, uh, not fiscal, for this uh, stimulus package which we uh, had. Third uh, important issue while uh, going through large-scale fiscal consolidation of uh, over 10% of GDP, uh, it's important to ensure uh, 
social stability. So for this, uh, uh, also uh, in cooperation with World Bank, we uh, involved, uh, developed so-called uh, minimum social safety network, which was uh, uh, targeted as exactly those uh, uh, people who were most affected by the crisis. So we had a very substantive temporary works program for unemployed, uh, prolonged unemployed benefits uh, payments period, increased guaranteed minimum income benefit, which was uh, what people get after they stop receiving unemployed benefit, uh, uh, co-finance some benefits to local governments, improved accessibility of healthcare and medicines to poor people. And uh, really, uh, I think this was one of the factors which helped to ensure uh, social stability. So while facing tax raises and wage cuts and so, uh, people still could see that uh, uh, state is taking care of those uh, most in need uh, during this uh, crisis. Uh, coming to the structural reforms agenda, uh, we had uh, had been doing quite substantial uh, structural reforms in a number of sectors, including public administration, education and healthcare. And interestingly, on education and healthcare, luckily we did not how to come up with a new ideas uh, how to uh, do reforms there, because the principles of reforms were known already from 1990s. There had been World Bank papers uh, with uh, detailed uh, proposals on structural reforms in education, uh, introduction of principal money follows pupil, optimization of a school's network. There was uh, detailed recommendations on what we call master plan in uh, healthcare, uh, also to do with uh, 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 optimization of hospital uh, network with uh, primary care and, and so on and so on. Uh, so for there, all those structural forms were basically no, but as I love to say, reform starts where the money ends. So when the, all those documents were drafted, it was just politically not popular to do so, and so it basically nothing was done. So what we had to do, we basically had to take those reforms and implement them. Exactly what we did uh, during the last year, of course we had to do it in an accelerated pace without proper uh, safeguards and uh, not everything went so smoothly as if it would have been if it would have been done in a due time. But well, unfortunately uh, we only uh, did those reforms once uh, uh, once uh, our uh, money uh, ended. So in, in, uh, uh, in this term now it seems that uh, we are on a path of economic recovery. Unemployment is decreasing every month uh, since uh, March. There are first signs of uh, economic uh, recovery, growth, not recession, finally. Uh, there is quite robust growth of industrial production and uh, exports and uh, also from a, so to say, world attention point of view, Latvia is off rather, and where we were considered to be the country worst affected by economic crisis in the EU. Now this attention has uh, shifted to southern Europe, to Greece, uh, Spain, some other countries, and uh, probably there's also some, some lessons uh, to be learned from our experience uh, how to deal with uh, internal uh, devaluation. Because in a case of Latvia, we uh, theoretically had this debate that we could have chosen also to go for devaluation, uh, but our feeling is that devaluation is easy way for a government. It's not even government's decision, it's central bank's decision. But certainly it's not an easy way for the people as it immediately erodes uh, real value of the savings, real value of the incomes of pretty much everyone. So, and it's also a huge redistribution of wealth from uh, uh, pretty much everyone to a couple of exporters. And even there, being a very small and very open economy, those competitiveness gains would have been short-lived because uh, 
imported energy prices would increase immediately, imported component prices would increase immediately, and we didn't see much uh, gain on this. Plus, while doing uh, through the fiscal adjustment, we in fact had to implement also many uh, overdue uh, structural reforms, which otherwise probably would not be implemented again, and uh, those imbalances would continue to uh, accumulate. Whereas now, if we look at the example of Eurozone countries, in Eurozone countries, uh, technically speaking, there is no this option of uh, devaluation, because uh, uh, if you are in Eurozone and want to continue uh, with Euro as a stable and credible currency, you cannot uh, call for devaluation of Euro. Uh, so really, it is this path of internal devaluation, which is the one you uh, have to uh, follow. And uh, uh, there, I really feel that uh, there is uh, some, uh, some lessons which could be learned from uh, our experience, which we had uh, gone through uh, in the last uh, one and a half uh, years. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very, very much um, for those very insightful comments. I, I have to say I, I really enjoy the quote, reform starts where the money ends, and I think that's, uh, that's uh, certainly a keeper, and, and we're very grateful for, uh, for the articulation of really the measures and the scale and the scope of the measures that Latvia has had to take uh, to, to weather uh, the economic crisis. So uh, with, with your permission and the audience permission, uh, we have approximately a half an hour for, for discussion and conversation. The moderator has the great privilege of not only keeping the clock, uh, but of throwing out the first, uh, first question or so, so with, to get that conversation started, and then uh, we look forward to taking your, your questions. Mr. Prime Minister, I, I have a, a two-part question. Um, one is sort of internal to the uh, EU dynamic during this economic crisis, and then one is sort of uh, addressing uh, the economic, uh, the ramifications of the economic crisis on NATO and larger European defense spending efforts. But my first question, are you concerned that uh, Europe will start developing a two-tiered uh, Europe, those within the Eurozone, those who uh, stay uh, beyond uh, and outside of the Eurozone. Other countries have expressed their concern as the EU starts to articulate its economic government structure. Um, are you concerned about a two-tiered uh, Europe moving forward economically? And then second, you've, you've articulated a, a series of very tough choices, and Latvia had to make a very tough choice about whether to sustain its deployment in Afghanistan during these uh, very dire economic days, and Latvia chose to remain uh, in Afghanistan. Um, but moving forward, do you think there will be uh, more difficult decisions about uh, Latvia's uh, military spending, its, its security posture vis-a-vis -vis NATO in light of some of the, the still uh, deep cuts that will have to be made in your, uh, in your fiscal outlook? Well, uh, thank you. So uh, on the first question on uh, Eurozone and Eurozone versus non-Eurozone countries, well, uh, I don't think there is uh, so much concern for uh, developing a two-speed uh, Europe. And uh, what we currently see with the crisis in uh, Eurozone, it's, it's quite clear that the problem of Eurozone is lack of control mechanisms within Eurozone. Because with new countries which are just to join the Eurozone, it's relatively clear you either fulfill master criteria or you are not allowed in. Whereas Within Eurozone, there are no control mechanisms, and in fact, we know that most Eurozone countries do not fulfill master criteria. And uh, that's uh, certainly a problem. And uh, until 2003, there were, in fact, sanction mechanisms. Uh, those were later scrapped. Uh, now, Commission is coming up with the proposals of pre-screening national budgets before uh, they, those can be submitted to the Parliament to ensure uh, that uh, 
countries of uh, EU countries basically would uh, follow uh, stability and growth pact uh, rules. Uh, Latvia is supporting this uh, proposal and we are open to discuss also other kind of uh, proposals. It's quite clearly that there are control mechanisms needed within Eurozone to ensure that countries fulfill their own rules because unfortunately we see that without those control mechanisms that's not always the case. Uh, another important aspect on this, uh, there are uh, lots of discussions about new EU economic uh, governance, but uh, my personal feeling is that uh, these proposals still will help to work within the existing uh, uh, institutional uh, framework within this existing treaty. Uh, because uh, there's not much uh, appetite in the EU to draft a new treaty after two uh, failed referendums on the constitutional treaty in France and in Netherlands, after two uh, referendums in Ireland on Lisbon Treaty, uh, there is really not uh, so much willingness to open the treaty again and to start renegotiate uh, this once again. So uh, there will be limitations uh, which, with the framework, which in fact was created just before this uh, economic trouble started and just before people started to think about that kind of an economic governance uh, issues. So uh, my guess is that we'll be still be acting within uh, Lisbon Treaty, but also there you can be creative. We know that uh, in uh, what Germans were very much uh, indicating that there is a no bailout clause in, in the treaty. So Eurozone countries cannot be bailed out because they are uh, supposed not to run in trouble. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, 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 once uh, the situation in Greece developed, they had to read more carefully the treaty and to discover, okay, bailout is not allowed, let's call it rescue, and uh, that bilateral loans, direct bilateral loans from EU member states or Eurozone countries to other Eurozone countries are not uh, uh, prohibited, and that's how the uh, rescue package for Greece uh, was prepared. In a structure, it's uh, relatively similar in, in fact to Latvia's package. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, European, it's uh, mainly uh, European loans, bilateral loans of EU member states with a substantial IMF financing. In Latvia's case, it was easier. We were not in part in Eurozone, so we also have bilateral uh, loans of European countries with a substantial IMF financing, but we also have European Commission loans which is not the case uh, in uh, Greece because of this no bailouts uh, clause. Uh, but uh, uh, so really uh, we will have to work within existing treaty and uh, recreate uh, control mechanisms to ensure that uh, Eurozone follows its own rules. I think that's key for uh, successful uh, fun functioning of the Euro for credibility of the Euro as global currency. <laughs> And uh, that's, uh, I think that's, uh, that's how it's going to happen. So second uh, question on uh, defense spending and defense uh, efforts. Yes, we also, uh, while downsizing budget, pretty much every field was affected and uh, defense was no exception. So uh, there uh, we uh, had to also prioritize uh, our uh, spendings and uh, quite clear one of our priorities was also to maintain uh, our current or uh, existing level of engagement in Afghanistan uh, in international operations uh, because uh, uh, our feeling is that we have to do our part of the job as a NATO uh, members. Uh, it's important for Latvia to be a part of the solution for global uh, safety uh, rather than part of the problem. So we are sticking with our obligations and in fact our uh, uh, contribution to uh, NATO uh, forces in or ISAF forces in uh, Afghanistan is uh, one of the highest in uh, per capita terms. Uh, so we are uh, maintaining this uh, level of engagement and in fact during the crisis we also assumed uh, lead nations status for a so-called Northern Distribution Network, which is uh, uh, 
uh, uh, transferring U.S. and NATO goods to Afghanistan uh, via northern route uh, through uh, Latvia, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan to Afghanistan uh, as an alternative and supplement to the southern route uh, via Pakistan. Uh, and uh, uh, all in general, uh, it's quite clear once uh, uh, countries will have to go through uh, fiscal adjustment in uh, EU, uh, quite clear, it's going also to affect uh, defense spending. There is basically no way around it, so then it's a question of uh, uh, prioritizing uh, the choices and uh, looking that uh, it would not affect uh, uh, defense uh, capacity in a medium and long uh, term. That's uh, how we also see uh, 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 the developments in Latvia, and in fact, uh, this also allowed us to uh, implement a successful com command reform uh, while re really streamlining and downsizing the command while at the same time uh, uh, keeping troops uh, uh, at the uh, ground level. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. I'll just uh, open the floor now to question. If you could raise your hand. We have uh, colleagues with microphones. And uh, the, wait for the microphone to come. And if you could uh, please give us your name and your affiliation before you pose the question to the Prime Minister. Sir, right there. Thank you for a brilliant presentation. My name is Alex Grigoryev. I'm working for uh, Voice of America Russian Service. What are you thinking about the future of euro as a global currency? You mentioned about that, but what are you thinking about? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, there is still future in Europe as a uh, global currency and as a reserve currency, but it's uh, quite clear that uh, now, in a year or two, Eurozone will be going through the crisis. Uh, countries will have to do uh, fiscal adjustment. Uh, it may affect also the economic growth rate in uh, Europe, but there is uh, no way around it. And uh, I don't think that uh, any of those hastily conclusions which are sometimes being drawn that Eurozone would disintegrate or uh, countries would uh, start to throw some countries out of the Eurozone. I don't think anything of this will uh, happen. It, it is going to be a year or two of uh, quite substantial trouble to go through this crisis. Uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, you, Eurozone will stay, Euro will stay. Uh, as a project, uh, I think it's uh, one of the most successful projects uh, in the EU, uh, internal market, common uh, currency, and it has brought lots of benefits to the uh, European uh, economy. There are also some uh, more ideas coming up uh, on more bolder scale, uh, also probably making some joint European lending for sovereign debt and uh, other ideas. So I think there is different uh, directions where you can, uh, in fact, uh, deepen this uh, cooperation. So my prediction, uh, Euro, Euro will stay. In any case, it's also part of our exit strategy to bring budget deficit uh, to the master criteria levels in 2012 with a target date for joining Eurozone in January 1st, 2014. And in this sense, it was very important signal we were receiving just previous uh, weeks uh, that Eurozone is an open project and that uh, uh, current Eurozone troubles are not affecting Eurozone enlargement. We know last year Estonia met Maastricht criteria pretty much one of the very few EU 27 countries which met master criteria last year, and uh, they are on their path to uh, Eurozone accession in uh, uh, January 1st next uh, year. Yes, sir, the gentleman down the front. Microphone is coming. My name is uh, Walter Statler, uh, National Defense University Foundation. My background is uh, career diplomacy. And by the way, I was the US member of the IDAB, the International Defense Advisory Board for the Three Baltic Republics uh, during the late 1990s and uh, earlier part of this decade. My question concerns uh, foreign investment 
which as we know is uh, really key to maintaining uh, equilibrium in the economy because it brings not only money, uh, but uh, employment and technology as well. And my question is, uh, what is, a, is Latvia doing to uh, uh, attract uh, that foreign investment? Uh, okay, uh, so uh, first of all, again, one of the macroeconomic data I didn't mention uh, during the introductory uh, speech, uh, also first quarter of this year was uh, the one when we saw again increased flow of foreign de de direct investment uh, in Latvia. Uh, first thing we had to do uh, initially was to really stabilize the economy. That's a short term uh, question. Uh, nobody is going to invest in a country which is deemed uh, economically and financially unstable. So that was really the first thing. Uh, once we did it, once this signal is going through the world, so to say, that uh, really uh, economy is uh, more stable, there are uh, growth potential, and so then investors also start to look at uh, other matters, and this policy of internal devaluation also improved our uh, competitiveness, improved our re real effective exchange rate, and um, uh, so uh, we also see some increase in uh, FDI. Then uh, it also takes uh, some uh, uh, practical uh, work to be done. Uh, so for, we work in uh, several uh, directions of the plan for improving the uh, business environment and then work on implementing this plan. This is a continuous effort. Now we also are setting uh, uh, some uh, project lists and team uh, uh, ad hoc working groups basically to deal with the large incoming uh, FDI projects uh, because what we had uh, felt as experience also in previous years that some projects were not implemented for the reasons that uh, they were just stuck somewhere in bureaucratic layers and could not uh, really uh, pass through them. So for this uh, sense it's important really to uh, help uh, especially if you talk on, on large projects to deal with a bureaucracy, to deal with a red tape, and also to signal that this uh, uh, FDI is uh, welcome in Latvia. So there we also see some uh, growth. Right, uh, John Miller with Raytheon. Uh, may I ask, do you think the economic situation will cause, uh, be an impetus for greater cooperation with Estonia and Latvia and perhaps other countries? And if so, what areas did you, would you see greater cooperation uh, coming to pass? Well, uh, I would say regardless of the economic situation, we have a great cooperation with Estonia and uh, Lithuania. And it was also so, uh, so uh, during the crisis, we were coordinating to extend our uh, uh, tax policies. We are now working on some projects of uh, uh, even deeper economic in integration than EU would uh, require uh, to uh, really trying to create uh, Baltic states as a single, uh, possibly single uh, market. And uh, certainly we have uh, cooperation on uh, political issues, regular consultations, uh, where I would say traditionally we had been uh, very supportive to each other. So uh, I would say in this political dimension, uh, I wouldn't expect much uh, major change uh, due to this economic crisis. It's really more to do with uh, uh, economic government uh, issues, uh, some control mechanisms issues to ensure that we do not run in that kind of crisis again. Uh, uh, also some political, large political processes we can uh, see like uh, reset policy between US and Russia, which also has so far I'd say positive implications for uh, Latvian and Baltic states relations with Russia for EU-Russia relations, uh, but I don't think it's so directly linked with the economic uh, crisis. Uh, so those, uh, I, I wouldn't make uh, too much uh, links there.
Hello, sir. Welcome. Doma Juricic from Embassy of Croatia. Just wanted to hear your view on the EU enlargement process, uh, not only to Croatia, but also to other Western Balkan countries. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, Latvia has always uh, advocated uh, that EU should be an open uh, project, also open to enlargement. And in this sense, we have always supported uh, Croatia's uh, way towards EU accession. And uh, we see that uh, you are making real progress. And I think it's uh, really uh, a question of relatively short uh, perspective before you will be in the EU. We know that uh, other uh, Balkan countries are in different stages of negotiation. And uh, so far, uh, countries which had expressed interest uh, from uh, 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 Balkans towards EU integration are uh, really at various stages of uh, uh, progress. We know that uh, EU enlargement as, as a whole is uh, 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 also a controversial project. Uh, not Every country in the EU are very supportive. There are talks of EU enlargement fatigue. Uh, uh, there, were, uh, there is a situation with uh, Turkey, as we know, that first they are granted candidate countries' uh, status, and then questions are asked, do they really belong to Europe? Probably it should have been other way around. Uh, briefly, there were some discussions uh, of maybe Ukraine's way towards EU accession, but that was not even mentioned in the EU enlargement strategy of like, what was it, 2004 or 2005. So uh, also it has its uh, limitations and uh, political limitations uh, within uh, EU. But as, uh, as regards uh, Balkans, uh, uh, I would say that's one of the regions where EU in general is uh, positive and those, uh, there will be real progress and Croatia will be in, in in a matter of, I don't know, one, two years. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. I'm going to take the two that are right beside each other, sir, gentlemen in the blue, and then you can just pass the microphone to the gentleman beside you. And uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you can bundle those two questions and then okay. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll finish up mm -hmm. there. The gentleman with the blue shirt and the yellow tie, and then pass it down. Thank you. <clears throat> Bob McClellan, retired Department of Defense, more specifically, Latvian historian. Uh, it is my understanding that Latvia was experiencing a population drain. Has that stopped? And did the government taking any uh, effort to stop it? Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Stoltenberg, uh, State Department, uh, analyst covering uh, Poland and the Balkans, Baltic states. Um, the cuts uh, that you've described in terms of social benefits and salaries uh, seem amazing uh, that, you've been able, that your uh, population has been able to withstand that. Uh, you're entering a uh, parliamentary election season, uh, as I understand it, and I don't see any evidence that the uh, economic reforms that you've introduced or the cuts that you've uh, implemented have necessarily uh, impacted you negatively in terms of your political prospects in the upcoming election. So my question is, how did you manage to <laughs> implement this program and not uh, in bring about a, a huge social backlash against against your government? I think that that might be an interesting lesson for other governments to take note. Uh, okay, so um, on the first uh, question, uh, really, we had this uh, problem with uh, immigration, especially during. Uh, uh, years 2004-2005, just after our EU accession. Uh, wage levels in Latvia were much lower than old EU member states and with a free movement of labor. And three countries initially opened up their labor markets. This was like UK, Ireland and Sweden. In fact, uh, many people left estimates vary. Some more typical estimates are around 50,000 people uh, left uh, Latvia to work in uh, old uh, EU member states. Then when economy was booming, in fact, we saw that this tendency stopped and even reversed. People started to come back to Latvia. Uh, but now with 
economic crisis again with la uh, high unemployment with wages suppressed to the extent again we are again uh, having this uh, problem but as we learned uh, from the previous way you cannot just increase uh, salaries uh, because then uh, without increasing productivity and that's exactly what happened in latvia uh, after eu accession we had a period of very rapid wage growth uh, we lost our competit uh, competitiveness we ran into uh, deepest crisis in the eu and uh, uh, so that's why we are also thinking very much of the change of the structure of the economy so that our economic growth would be sustainable because fundamental answer to uh, this immigration problem is uh, to ensure more or less uh, equal uh, salaries or not so dramatic salary differences between uh, Latvia and some other EU member states. Uh, uh, coming uh, to the second question on uh, social stability, I mentioned one uh, of the points which was this uh, social safety network which was uh, important. Also, we had uh, lots of uh, uh, discussions with uh, uh, social partners, with employers organizations, with trade unions, with uh, local governments union. Uh, and in fact, 2009 budget amendments, which were the most painful ones, so to say, were made based on agreement between um, coalition parties and trade unions, employers, local government union. Uh, not that they really wanted to know about it l later, but it was written, it was on paper, and of course, then there were many uh, discussions. Yes, we kind of supported it, but not really. But at least they were kind of on board, which was uh, important to also uh, have on the, them on board. We launched what we call a reform management group, where uh, government was sitting together with, with, with exactly these uh, social partners. And it also gave their part of the uh, contribution. And uh, yes. Uh, while the approval ratings uh, of government, of, or myself if you want, uh, were falling when we were making 2009 amendments, 2010 budget, uh, it started uh, to improve again once uh, people saw that, well, the situation is to, ex to the extent stabilized, we are coming back to economic growth, and uh, really we see that uh, it also improved approval ratings of my party, of uh, of myself uh, being one of the uh, most uh, popular politicians in the country. Uh, but, uh, of course, it's always uh, uh, fragile. Of course, there are more decisions to make, and you never know where exactly it's uh, too much politics is, uh, is always a very unpredictable business. So you cannot be enjoying too much now I'm popular. Maybe in a month I will not, not be unpopular again. <laughs> so this is what you don't know, yeah? But uh, really, it was this social safety network and social dialogue which were important to ensure. And uh, also, interestingly, if we compare uh, with the situation of Greece and public opinion polls in Greece show that most of Greeks, in fact, uh, support those uh, austerity measures uh, implemented by governments. They understand that that's what it is, that those are the choices, and there are some uh, militant entities which are uh, creating those uh, protests and this huge uh, negative publicity uh, about uh, this uh, situation. But if you look at the polls, in fact, uh, most of the Greeks also say, yes, we understand it's a crisis, we need to do something about it. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, I'd like to thank you for your thoughtful remarks, your very candid remarks, and I think I'll end where Dr. Hamry began, that in times of, of a deep crisis, uh, our nations turn to leaders who can see them through those troubled times, and uh, Latvia, in its wisdom, selected you to lead uh, them through this very uh, difficult time. So we thank you, and I thank the audience. You asked some terrific questions and uh, very insightful as well. So I thank you very much. Please join me in a round of applause for the time. Thank you.